May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. A few days ago, I was sitting in my living room, intently concentrating on my latest knitting project, when something caught at the edge of my peripheral vision. It just caught my eye, and it caused me to look up and out the window. Now, I don't know if it was a squirrel or a bird. I don't remember that part, what it was that caught me. But what I do remember thinking was, oh my goodness, it's five o'clock in the afternoon, and the light is still shining. Have you noticed that? Yes. Every year, I have this moment like I've never had it before when I notice the lengthening daylight and I rejoice that spring is on its way. And yes, I'm from New England and I do know it's February and we've got a fair bit of winter to get through yet. But that lengthening light, it gives me hope that spring is actually going to come. Now, just as some of us might have been noticing some of the, some of the changes to, to the environment out there right at the moment, you may have noticed that things look a little bit different in here this moment, uh, this morning as well, right? Anybody notice? Kind of changed up the colors, right? We veiled the crosses with greens and no flowers. So what's that all about? What's happening? It's Lent. That's right, we've entered into a new season in the church calendar. We've arrived at the season of Lent. Now, interestingly, the word Lent comes from an old English word, lengthen, which means lengthen, as in the lengthening light of spring. So Lent is also meant to give us hope, but that does not mean that this is an easy season. The Christian writer Kate Bowler says that Lent is the season where we prepare for the holiest and hardest days of our story. Lent is a 40-day journey with Jesus as he prepares for the holiest and hardest days of his story, his passion, death, and resurrection. And there are markers all along the way that remind us of where we are in the journey. As I said, we have the colors. Thank God the seasons are color-coded in the church. Uh, we have the decor changes. There are changes in the liturgy, subtle changes in the liturgy. Last week, we put away the alleluias with the kids, remember? And we'll take them out again at Easter. And our Eucharistic prayer will shift around. Maybe there are some changes for you in terms of your personal devotional practices during Lent, things that you've taken on or given up. And then... There are the stories and the themes in scripture that also remind us of this holiest and hardest part of the journey. So on the first Sunday of Lent, the gospel is always the same story. Did you know that? It's always the same. Anybody know what the story is? We just read it. Always, the first Sunday of Lent, the story in scripture, the gospel, is the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Whether we read Matthew, Mark, or Luke in the lectionary cycle, that is where we begin in Lent, with Jesus being tempted by Satan in the wilderness. Now this year, we read Mark's vision, version of Jesus' temptation, but I have to say that if you yawned at just the right moment, you might have missed it because Mark devotes all of two sentences to Jesus' temptation. So it's worth it for me to read them again. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited upon him. Now, if you remember the story of Jesus' temptation from Sunday school days, you might be wondering where all the details went, right? I mean, in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, we get much more information about the kinds of temptations Jesus faced. We hear how Jesus wrestled with the possibility of using his, own, his identity and his power to serve his own needs, 
and his own sense of his purpose. But Mark does not seem the least bit interested in the specific temptations that Jesus faced. Rather, Mark seems very interested in where Jesus faced those temptations. In the flow of Mark's narrative, the story of Jesus' temptation happens between two other very important events in Jesus' life. His baptism, which we also heard again this morning, and his first sermon, Repent and Believe the Good News. Now, geographically, Jesus' temptation happens in the wilderness. And this is a de de detail that Mark mentions twice in two sentences. So to him, it's important. At his baptism, Jesus is told that he is God's beloved son, and God is well pleased with him. And he is empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the work that God has given him to do. What an amazing moment that must have been for him. To feel God's pleasure and to sense God's power at work in him by the Holy Spirit. But before he can teach a single word, preach a single sermon, or heal a broken body, that same Holy Spirit drives him out into the wilderness. Literally, the Spirit takes him and tosses him out on his ear into the wilderness. Now, geographically speaking, Jesus was already in the wilderness. That's where John the baptizer did his work, in the Judean wilderness. So, what kind of wilderness does Jesus now find himself in after his baptism? Is it a physical place or an emotional and spiritual place? Or maybe all three? Whatever the case, it sounds like this wilderness is a dark and dangerous place for anyone to be in, even Jesus. Now, the wilderness is a powerful part of the landscape of the biblical story, both literally and figuratively. Surely it represents the wild, rugged, uninhabited places where the people of Israel often found themselves traveling through for long periods of time. Their collective memory was shaped by the 40 years they had wandered in the wilderness after God set them free from slavery in Egypt. So hunger, thirst, and fear were the real deal for the people of Israel. They knew it well. But the wilderness also became a metaphor for spiritual and emotional life of the people of God as well. For them, being in the wilderness meant being in a place of grave spiritual danger, where forces hostile to God seem to thrive. And God? Well, in the wilderness, God seems to be far, far away. Again and again, the people of God find themselves in the wilderness through their own rebellion or the oppression of others. The wilderness is part of their story, and not even Jesus is spared. Now, of course, the truth is that the wilderness is also part of our story. Now, we may not have ever been in a desert or a geographic wilderness, but each of us has spent time in the wilderness in one way or another. Each of us has known hardships and heartaches that have put us in grave spiritual danger and left us vulnerable to the forces of evil and feeling as if God were far, far away. Sound like a familiar place to any of you? Those wilderness experiences are different for each of us. For some of us, the wilderness involves physical illness or limitation. For others, the death of someone we love can take us there. Sometimes the wilderness looks like the rugged peaks and valleys of unruly emotions or relationships. The wilderness can be addiction, aging, financial struggles, or just plain loneliness. There are lots of different ways to get to the wilderness, but one way or another, we all find ourselves there at some point or perhaps many points in our lives. 
And while our wilderness wanderings may be triggered by life circumstances, in the spiritual wilderness, we always find ourselves wrestling with our divine vocation, our true identity and purpose as God's beloved. Now, I don't know what the wilderness has looked like for each of you, but I do know what wilderness has looked like for me over the years. And it turns out I don't have to go very far to get there. The biggest wilderness I face on a regular basis is the one right between my ears. Now that doesn't mean it's barren and empty out there, up there, though sometimes it kind of feels that way. More often than not, it's filled with a lot of noise and loud and persistent whispers that keep telling me that God isn't there and God doesn't care. Those are the wild beasts that I have to deal with. And make no mistake, when I'm stuck in that place, I am in grave spiritual danger. So what do I do when I find myself in the wilderness? Well, first of all, I try to remember that Jesus was no stranger to the wilderness. And he didn't go there just once. Throughout his life, Jesus wrestled with his divine vocation as a messiah. I think that's why so often we read of him retreating to a deserted place to pray and to reconnect with God. Jesus struggled in the wilderness, but he also came out the other side. Now, what got Jesus through? Well, the Gospels make it really clear that Jesus knew his Bible. The story of God's gracious love and deliverance was firmly planted in his mind and his heart, so he had something to work with, an alternative narrative to Satan's lies. But this morning's gospel simply tells us that during his temptation, with the wild beasts roaring all around, there were angels who waited on him. Now, angels are God's messengers. They bring us important news God wants us to hear. I wonder, what was the message they had for Jesus in the middle of his particular wilderness? Of course, we don't know, because Mark doesn't supply any details. But I can't help but think, if the angels came to remind him of what had just happened to him, right before he got tossed in the wilderness. Remember what happened? He was baptized, remember? Yeah, he was baptized. And at that moment, God called him his beloved and gave him the power to face the wilderness and do what God had called him to do. Now, for most of us, I think, our baptism was a long, long time ago, right? Mine was. And I know that it's easy for me to forget that I'm someone who is baptized and beloved of God, especially when the wilderness of life presses in upon me. And I need, and I think we all need, angels to remind us of who we are and what God has done for us and is doing through us. Who have those angels been for you? I bet some of them are sitting right in this room. In fact, one of the most important reasons God has for gathering God's people together as church is that so we can remind one another that God is there and God cares. And that simple but powerful message I think is especially critical to remember as we walk through this time of transition together. At our vestry meeting last week, we read the story of the temptation of Jesus, and someone remarked that this time of transition at Christ Church feels sort of like a wilderness. Amen? Anybody else feeling that way? There's so much that seems uncertain right now. So all the more reason to be ministering angels for one another by reminding each other that God is there and God cares. And we have a divine purpose to accomplish together.
In the midst of his wilderness wanderings, God provided for Jesus. He sent his angels to be with Jesus, to remind Jesus of who he was, and to show Jesus he was not alone. God was with him, and God got him through the wilderness to the other side. And it was then, and only then, that Jesus really knew the power of God and had something profound to proclaim. What are we going to remember when we are in the midst of our wilderness wanderings? First, please remember that God has been there. Jesus has been there too. Jesus knows what it's like to be in the wilderness. And remember your baptism. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. You are God's beloved and he has given you the power to be and do whatever God has called you to do. My friend, in this, world, in this life, my friends, the wilderness is going to come. Count on it. But remember, if God calls you to it, God will get you through it. So when you get to the other side, what an incredible good news story you'll have to share. Amen.